Hey everyone, welcome back into the Metaverse. This is the Upland Show, episode number three. My name is McSqueeb. And I'm Loyal Doyle. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed episodes one and two. Tonight, we're super excited. We have a great episode for you. We're specifically going to be talking about how the metaverse is the future, and we invite you to please come and join on the land grab. Okay. What do we mean by all this? Well, this is going to be a good episode because we have plenty of content to share with you. So recently, in the last few, uh, I think the last four or five days. Yeah, I think it was last week, actually. Yeah, yeah. So as, at the recording of this particular episode, I think uh, today's the 16th, and uh, I think this was debuted, this particular content that we're about to share with you. Well, I think it was released um, in maybe June 10th or June 12th or so. Yep. Okay, so what are we talking about? Well, Upland, the, the creators of Upland, including Dirk, the CEO of Upland, he was interviewed by uh, the fine folks at 60 Minutes. Everybody knows 60 Minutes, certainly a, a leading journalism uh, show. And uh, they wanted to talk specifically about uh, NFT technology and the metaverse. There was a two-part series, or in other words, they split the, uh, their, their discussion and their coverage of the metaverse and uh, NFT technology into two separate episodes. And in ep So that was episodes 17 and 18 of season one, I believe. Is that yeah. correct? Yes, okay. 60 minutes plus. It's on Paramount Plus. It's only five bucks a month, just like Hulu or or what or different streaming services, and and you can check out sixty minutes plus and lots of cool episodes. Uh, it's, uh, episodes seventeen and eighteen is a two part series for NFTs and the metaverse, and they go into detail about bunch of cool bunch of cool stuff. You should definitely check it out. Yeah, the reason why I'm actually particularly individually excited about those two particular episodes is because I'm telling you, and maybe you can relate, I have tried to explain to my parents what Upland <laughs> is <laughs> and what NFT technology is uh, and what the metaverse is. It just is not, it's just not getting in, right? Nothing against them, nothing against, well, maybe it's more my fault and my ability to uh, articulate it. But this, these, th um, if you're with me, if you're having the same problem with your, uh, with your family or friends um, and trying to explain the value of Upland or the metaverse or NFT technology or crypto technology, cryptocurrency, watch these two episodes, forward them to your friends, and uh, it's going to be very helpful. Now, Loyal Doyle and I, uh, watched both episodes, uh, of course, because we are Uplanders. We're dedicated to the craft and to the game. Uh, and we're dedicated to bringing you the, uh, the latest news, but also the, greatest, uh, the latest tips and tricks and strategies to help you be successful. And I think this particular uh, conversation is going to be very relevant in the, to help with those objectives because the, these two episodes certainly were very well done. Um, and we want to share with you some clips from the episode. At the same time, I think we kind of take issue on a few of the discussions that were being um, that were Definitely. Th that were shared in the episode, and we'll we'll share those as well. You're f you can feel free to disagree with us, but uh, we are going to share with you our thoughts at least, um, and uh, where they may have been absolutely correct, and where they may yeah. have been a little bit off. Yeah. O overall, I think they did a pretty good job at explaining what nfts are the value of nfts why people care about nfts what are nfts non-fungible tokens right you know and uh let's dive right in so we won't be sharing the video footage uh we don't want to get in trouble for anything like that but we will be sharing short uh clips i think i believe we have like five clips we'd like to share uh, sh uh, should we jump right into the first one? Yeah, let me just tee that up a little bit. So these are audio clips, like like uh, Loyal Doyle mentioned. These are not video clips, but they're audio clips. The first audio clip I think is quite interesting. If any of you 
are like me and want to do some background research or information or uh, some, maybe some homework about who the founders are of whatever the um, idea or foundation or organization or the currency or asset that you're about to invest in, um, you will appreciate this particular clip because it shows the CEO of Upland and he talks a little bit about what inspired him to create Upland and maybe what his vision is just a little bit. All right, let's jump right into it. Here we go. Take me to the moment you came up with the concept for Upland. One night we saw our kids always playing the board game Monopoly. We said, wouldn't it be cool to take the whole world and put that on the blockchain and, and bring that together somehow? So there was this uh, Netflix series, it's called uh, Stranger Things, mm -hmm. where you know there's a parallel world, I mean, it's a little bit with monsters and stuff, but it looks really like, like the real world. So basically, we're about to start talking about a company that was inspired by Stranger Things and Monopoly. Yeah. That's Thank almost you. terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now Dirk, if you haven't already gathered or from your own research, Dirk is the CEO of the company that creates the game Upland. Dirk is a German native living in the Bay Area of San Francisco. His accent might be a little bit thick um, from, uh, you know, he has a German accent. And so if you didn't gather, what he said was, the inspiration behind Upland was from two sources. One was the game Monopoly, and then number two was the 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 Netflix series Stranger Things. Yeah, super cool. Have you like, seen Stranger Things? Absolutely, I love Stranger <laughs> right. Things. All three seasons. Yeah, that's great. For season four. Yeah, so in Stranger Things, for those of you who have not seen Stranger Things, it's about some children, uh, some teenagers, pre-teens who live in the early 80s, and through some circumstances, they are thrust into what could be described as an alternate alternative universe or an alternate universe. Um, the they upside it, down. They call they it call the upside it. down, right? Where where the town in which they live, which, uh, what is the town in which they live? What's that called? Um, New Jersey somewhere? I don't, I don't no, know. No, it's Indiana. Uh, oh my gosh, my kids would be really upset with me right now. At any rate, they live in a small town in, uh, in Indiana, and uh, the Upside Down is the exact same town, but in a more, like it's just a different, um, just a different instance of that town. Uh, it looks like it may, could be a different time. It could be a different... Um, it's definitely a scarier version of reality. Yeah, yeah it's a different, scarier version of yeah. the actual town. And and in this case, I think Dirk's inspiration was a parallel universe to the universe we currently live, the world we currently live in the virtual world, in the metaverse. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I, th I think we talked about in episode one. If you haven't seen episode one, I think it's worth for you to go back and watch episode one and, of course, episode two. Uh, YouTube.com forward slash The Upland Show. There you go. Uh, in, episode w in episode one, we do talk about how, um, you know, the show is, you know, connected to reality. There are other games out there who um, are working to create uh, maybe – a metaverse, but those metaverses are fictional or fictitious. They are, you know, space in space or on a different planet. Um, as far as I know, Upland is the only metaverse, virtual metaverse, that actually replicates planet Earth as we know it today. That's built on the real world. That's, or that's built on the real world with blockchain technology. Exactly. I believe there's other ones that are not built on blockchain technology obviously yeah. but but this is the only one that is has nfts is built on blockchain technology and replicates the the real world yeah absolutely so i mean that's kind of a cool thing so um if i were you i would research a little bit about dirk and maybe some of his uh you know to the co-founders of upland gives you a little bit more confidence in your investment because really this is not just a game but you are investing your money into this game with the expectation and hopes 
that you will build upon the money that you put into the game. And uh, so it's a long-term investment. And uh, of course, anytime you want to invest in any asset or movement or organization, it's very, very important that you research uh, the people who are behind what it is that you're throwing your money into. Yeah, and, and if you're watching live on YouTube, let's actually jump right in. It's fun, you, you know, a, as you bring that up, this is one of the first things I did actually when I looked into Upland was pull up the LinkedIn profile of Dirk, which is the one being interviewed in this 60 Minutes episode as the founder or co-founder of Upland. And honestly, this gave me more trust in my investment in this game. I felt more excited. So he's, again, co-founder of Upland, lead mentor of German Silicon Valley Accelerator. I imagine these are, you know, German companies uh, paving their path in, in Silicon Valley, uh, San Francisco. Uh, the advisor of digital transformation, advisor to founder and editor in chief. I, I mean, look at all these companies present that he's presently working with, as well as previous companies. You can go check this out yourself. Uh, LinkedIn is publicly available information. But then we can see he has he's a he has a PhD in economics. I would love to actually do. Dirk, if you're listening, we would love to do an interview and learn more about your background. What you know, go even deeper than we were able to hear than the small, you know, ten minutes or fifteen minutes that you were able to share on sixty minutes plus. We'd love to dive even deeper into some of that awesome information that that you shared with us. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I want to echo that, Dirk. And uh, speaking directly to you and say that um, I'm impressed by this from, from two, for, for two reasons. One is, any, as we mentioned earlier, anytime I am looking at a cryptocurrency or if I'm looking at uh, some new uh, development that, uh, or some company that is trying to um, you know, uh, make some improvements to the blockchain uh, technology, and, uh, and I'm thinking, okay, how can I help uh, fund this company or uh, make a little money off of it? Um, I'm going to, number one, look at who the development team is and if they are willing to be public as to who they are. Yeah. Um, that's a huge, huge, like, green flag, not a red flag, but a, like a green, that's a good sign um, that they are willing to disclose who they are uh, and their actual name. Um, meaning that they are staking their reputation behind their uh, their the, uh, the the investment. So that's a big thing. Number two is Dirk. I would say um, super impressive PhD in economics. It's there not are, easy. No, there are, there are a lot of programs out there, and I'm not going to mention any of those because I don't want to offend anybody. But there are some programs out there where you could probably do some kind of night school kind of thing and squeak by and get your PhD and whatever it is. Um, but I'm telling you, I have a bachelor's degree in economics, and the four le 400 level and 500 level uh, courses in economics, I mean, it kicked my butt. Like, it was intensely difficult. <laughs> yeah, um, I can imagine. Now, I mean, maybe you're probably thinking McSqueeb. With a name like McSqueeb, you're probably not the sharpest tool in the shed. Uh, I'm not going to argue there, but I'm just saying um, – you know, a, a PhD in economics, that's freaking hardcore. Absolutely. Okay, so impressed on those two reasons, Dirk. Okay, now back to the everybody else. I want to show you something really quick. Tyler's going to bring it here on the screen. This is a... this is a Little meme, big dream. Yeah, this is Kisho Eno. And uh, I actually am an investor in Kisho Eno. Now, I, I think I've mentioned in a few other episodes that I love and just am you know, addicted to learning about crypto technologies and investing in crypto coins. And I will say that 98% of all of my investments in the crypto space are with, um, you know, more developed technologies that actually do provide some sort of utility with either the blockchain or the internet or, um, you know, they're providing some sort of 
a real advancement in the de finance or the decentralized uh, finance movement. Okay, um, and that's where I place most of my investment. Occasionally, I'll have a little bit of fun and throw a few bucks towards some of these more meme coins, if you will. Now, this is one of the meme coins in which I have a few bucks in. Uh, it's called Kishu Inu, and it's really kind of a, uh, I want to say, almost like a uh, knockoff of Shiba Inu, which, by the way, is a little bit of a knockoff of Dogecoin, okay? Yeah, and I mean... It seems like they're owning that with the title "Little Meme Big." Dream. Yeah, they're not. They're not. Like they're not. Dogecoin was a big meme. You know, <laughs> they're saying "Little Meme Big Dream," right? right? And frankly, actually, if you're going to invest in a meme coin, personally, I would say invest in this one. Just, just saying, because they these guys have done some amazing things with their marketing and and uh, some some really cool stuff, but. I just want to, sh I bring this up because I want to provide a little bit of comparison or just juxtaposition to what we just talked about, how in, uh, in Upland, how the team is very, very visible about who they are. Okay, so Tyler's scrolling through the uh, KeishaInu.com website. We're learning all about the coin, all about the movement. We're learning all about how to uh, purchase it. Dude, going. well designed website. I'll yeah, give it's them beautiful. that. Yeah, really good art. Honestly, the marketing behind this team is actually really good. They've done some really cool stuff. Um, but the price is still way, way, wow. way, way low with a hundred quadrillion market. I mean, uh, dude, look at the current price, bro. <laughs> I know. You could put three bucks in, you have like a billion coins. <laughs> I kid you not. Okay, so we keep going. Okay, so they have their own swap. Um, they have their launch about you know their their uh, their moon map about how they're planning to take everyone to the moon. You know, all this is good, super good <laughs> stuff, right? Everything's Dude, great. Dude, this is the, I'm actually impressed with the website. More actually, than anything. yeah. So let me tell you, these guys have actually done some really cool things. They've actually gotten some celebrity endorsements. Uh, they've developed some animation about how the uh, the the Keisha dog is more. Um, viable of a investment than doge and or shiba and frankly they've done some they actually took over times square with a marketing you know like they, they just blistered times square with digital marketing i'm just getting a kick out of that dog playing the guitar <laughs> winking at me right <laughs> right all right so okay you know here's my point this is what this is the whole point of me bringing up this website the kishu team the founding team Kishu Man and Inu Dev. So everything about this coin, with the exception of there's really no purpose to the coin other than making some, making some money. Um, like I said, they're not forwarding the uh, advancement of any type of uh, you know DeFi um, in the DeFi space or blockchain improvements. They're just making some coin, hoping to, hoping to make some coin, you know. But a red flag in any investment that you do is if the people behind it are anonymous. Yeah. Who the hell is Kishu Man? And who the hell is Inu Dev? Is that this dog winking at me playing the guitar? Yeah, or is one that is this one and one is guy with glasses and a tie right. holding a briefcase waving right. at me? Now, I mean, you have to ask yourself, why are they choosing to be anonymous, right? Like, are they planning to rug pull? Are they planning to a slow rug pull? Are they expecting that they're not going to be successful so they don't want to anyone to kind of like come after them after they've invested their money and lost their money? I mean, you have to ask why are they being anonymous? Maybe they're just shy. Who knows? I'm not going to say that they're bad people. I'm not going to say this is a bad investment. I've actually made a few bucks off this thing, and I think you could too as well. My point is, is that Dirk stands behind what he's doing here with Upland. He's actually sitting there in the flesh in 60 minutes. He doesn't put a ski mask over his face. Uh, his voice is not digitized. He's not sitting in a dark room. He is saying, I am Dirk. This is my investment. This is my idea. Please join and let's go to the moon together as we work on Upland. So that's the first thing we want to kind of point out uh, with this that we've learned, at least, that we picked up from this 60 Minutes episode. Yeah, and, and I mean, look look at this. I mean, let's even pull up the other co-founder, Don, who's put, like, 
I actually love that point that you're making. These guys are putting their whole reputation on the line. Uh, Edan is a former analyst for Hewlett Packard, HP. Like, y- you know, these guys are putting their their background on the line. They're they're showing us who they are, what their background is, what their degrees are. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not like it says, uh, you know, um, uh, night shift leader at Taco Time. Like, or nothing's wrong with Taco. I mean, I love Taco Time. Nothing against your Upland products. Man or <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, Upland yeah. Dev. Right or it's like Llama. Is, is do we actually know that there's even two people who are in who right. who, who are managing this yeah, other absolutely. coin? Yeah, I mean, who knows? I mean, but it, again, I I do like this product though because like. <laughs> I want to make money. Great website. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So, okay. So that's the first thing we learned. Okay. So, um, but I'm telling you, you got to watch these two episodes because they're actually quite powerful. Um, a couple of things we took away from this, uh, these two episodes. Um, one was, you know, the, uh, as we mentioned, these are not two episodes that are specifically focused on Upland. These are two up episodes that are talking about the metaverse and are talking about NFT technology. So they're highlighting various different projects that have been successful over the past few years. Um, And one of those is maybe you've heard of this particular project or incident, uh, but there's an artist who chooses to go by the the alias name of Beeples. Sounds like Peoples, but it's a letter B as in boy, Beeples. And this person uh, was creating some digital art Every day, released on his, I think, Facebook page or social media somewhere. I think he was sharing them on Instagram. All of his, uh, every day for 5,000 days, he created a digital piece of art and uploaded them to his Instagram profile, which I believe is Beeple. Yeah, so by the way, 5,000 days is like around four and a half years. Like, that's insane. Every day. And he fact, he even mentions that he never missed a day, even when his wife was giving birth. And uh, his wedding day. And his wedding day. The guy was still, like, pumping out art on those several days. Now, he's, he's definitely a gifted artist. But what he did was he took all 5,000 of those images and brought them into this collage. It's like a tile. It's like 5,000 tile collage of his art and sold the digital version of that as an NFT. Yeah, let's uh, let's pull this up. If you're if you're watching on YouTube, uh, YouTube.com forward slash the Upland Show, we're pulling this up live. Beeple sold an NFT for sixty nine million dollars U.S. dollars, and you can see here. It's five thousand images and you can actually zoom in and see all these are beautiful pieces of digital art i'm not gonna lie like some of his stuff so not only are you getting one you're getting a collage of five thousand and you own a consistent effort five thousand days in a row of people's creation and i I mean that that means a lot to somebody out there and and we can actually dive right into the clip yeah of the person who bought this piece of art and why did they buy it yeah Uh, let's hear let's hear what he has to say the the guy who bought it is just as fascinating as the artist who created it why would you pay for a piece of stretch cloth with some like blobs of like color on it that doesn't have value. It's just a piece of cloth. You're going to pay millions of dollars for that? Or a baseball card. You look at a Mickey Mantle rookie baseball card. What? You're paying for a little piece of cardboard? The value is is the emotional connection you have with, with the Great. piece. Do you think it was worth $69 million? Uh, Yes. Because two people wanted to pay $69 million for it. So by definition of what anything is worth, anything right. is worth what people will pay for it. So... Technically, 
Yes. And with all art, you're going to have someone saying it's terrible, it's amazing, it's great, it's not worth it, it's worth it. It's they're all right. And they're all right because like everybody's opinion to me is just as valid. And it's like, if you like it, great. If you don't, okay. That's but, totally valid too. But the difference is this type of art is now on the radar because of what happened. Because no one has been talking about digital art being worth it or not worth it or valuable or not valuable exactly. until now. So I love this clip because that was the artist speaking, by the way. That was not the person who purchased the art, but that was the artist speaking about his art. And I loved when the journalist asked the question, is your art really worth $69 million? <laughs> now, we all, as human beings, want to be modest. That's a lot of money, <laughs> yeah, that's actually, a freaking by the way. That's a ton of money. <laughs> right. Most people will never earn that amount of money in their lifetime oh. of, of work. Most people will not earn a tenth of that. I mean, imagine $6.9 million that you could just, as a nest egg, right? Yeah. So I think all of us want to be modest. And if someone were to say, hey, McSqueeb, um, whatever it is you did today, was it worth you know, what you were compensated for what you did? And it would be easy for me to say, well, I did my best, you know, I mean, I, don't, I tried, you know, but yeah, maybe, I don't know, I mean, sure, you know, I mean, here's a guy who's got a camera trained on his face, and he knows this is on 60 Minutes, and the woman asks him, is your work worth $69 million? And he's thinking, I'm standing on the shoulders of thousands, if not millions of artists who are just as talented, maybe more talented than I am. Now, what do I say? And I loved his answer because he says, yes. I mean, immediately he says, yes. And what was his justification for why his work was worth $69 million? It's not because he, he no, notice he did not say, um, well, I mean, I've been training for 20 years. It's worth $69 million. Or, I put in, this is represents over 3,000 hours of my life. It's worth $69 million. Yeah. What he says was, it's worth $69 million because someone was willing to pay $69 million for it. Yeah, and, and I think the beauty, the beauty of that clip is that this is bigger than himself, and I think he recognizes that as an artist. I don't think... I mean, I know he's one of the single people to probably make the one of the biggest profits off of his NFT efforts, but there are bigger projects out there. There are bigger projects and more profitable pro profitable projects such as CryptoPunks, yeah. NBA Top Shot. There are other NFT projects out there making much more money. However, I loved as... And, and again, this is a shout out to this episode and, and a shout out for, for you guys to go in and watch deeper um, to, to, to really go go in and listen to this and see everything that he has to say. We can't cover it all on this podcast, but Beeple believes NFTs are the next big phase of art. And I loved this one clip. Uh, we, we won't share it today, but about the isms do you, do, do, right. you, do you remember this clip yeah, about about the yeah. isms of art yeah. and the different I, I don't even remember all the all the isms that uh, art at the, essentially the different phases and time periods that art has gone through and people very articulately described that he believes this is the next phase of art digital art is the next big phase and i think from there i mean think 20 years down the road i think nfts will be an old thing and that will will we'll be into a new phase so it's it's beautiful how he described it and I, and, and i love how he described it and it's exciting to be a part of this new nft craze that's going that's going on yeah and so so getting back to the yeah so i appreciate that and and getting back to the concept though of what is value. So when he talks about a baseball card, so imagine you had the rookie card of Babe Ruth. So early 1900s, I don't know when, when that guy started playing ball, 
1906 or something like that. If you had the rookie, the uh, one of the actual rookie cards of Babe Ruth, that's probably worth a good chunk of money. I have no idea what it's worth, but I'm sure it's worth a lot of money. Why is it worth a lot of money? Well, like he says, it's just a piece of old, yeah, aged at the end cardboard. Of the day, it's just a piece of cardboard with ink on it. Yeah, it's not going that little piece of cardboard. Um, you know, if nuclear, if a nuclear war happens and your home is destroyed and you've got a bunker full of food underground, um, that little card, you can't take that card and go, well, uh, you know, life is screwed. Um, we have about six months of canned peaches, but thank goodness I've got this, this <laughs> baseball card because, uh, you know, it's going to get me through the next three years uh, of these vigilantes coming at me with their rifles and their guns and their Idaho, uh, you know, principles uh, coming at me. But Nothing. thank goodness for those canned <laughs> peaches. <laughs> <laughs> canned peaches and my baseball card that's three by five piece of cardboard minted in 1905, right? There's no value to it. <laughs> the value is what you place in it as an individual plus scarcity, right? So, Someone bought Beeple's NFT image on the blockchain. And the great thing about the blockchain is that it's basically the great, the, honestly, one of the greatest values of the blockchain is that it is proof of indistinguishable ownership. You are the sole owner of the entire world of that particular, or you're one of a few. But at any rate, someone bought that. And they said, I believe it's worth $69 million, so therefore it is worth $69 million. Yeah, let's actually jump into the next clip of the actual person who bought right, the this, clip. This, and again, or this guy is just... bought the piece of art. He's just as fascinating as Beeple's is. Right? Yeah. This guy's cool. This guy paid... Remember, this individual, Vinesh Sindar... Sorry. Well, Sindarsan. Sindarsan. Uh, paid. This is the guy that paid sixty nine million dollars. Let's hear, let's hear what he has to say. You spent sixty nine million dollars on a piece of art you'll never be able to physically touch. Why? I'll be able to do a lot more things. Uh, physically touching is is, you know, it's okay. <laughs> Maybe I can print it out and touch it if I want to. I don't know. What do you tell folks who say, I just don't understand it. I don't understand why even someone like you who has millions of dollars now is putting them towards this space you can't quite touch. So my first question would be, when do you think someone last touched the Mona Lisa? It's a physical painting, right? And we give so much importance to physically touching it. But can you touch it? The first thing they say when you enter a museum is don't touch anything, right? But it's there in front of you. You know <laughs> it's there, right? <laughs> See, that's the thing. It's, it's, just, it's just us. Most of the people in this world have experienced Mona Lisa as a digital form. Most of them. But, you know, definitely physicality and the ability, you know, to, to touch something is one of the dimensions of value, right? But what I'm trying to say is that that's not the only dimension of value. Human beings give value to stories. And we give a lot more value to a story than anything that's physical in this world. Metacovid? Well, so, man, one thing I have to say, you have to go, what, like, sorry we couldn't share the video version of this, but... I love the smile on his face yeah, when he's saying, real. like, yeah. have you ever touched the Mona Lisa? <laughs> right. <laughs> who's the last person who's actually physically touched the Mona Lisa? Like, why does that mean so much to you? Right. And I love, like, the smile. Like, he, it's kind of like this guy who's like, Trust me, I've thought about that. Like, <laughs> I know you're treating me like I'm an idiot, right. but I, I swear I've thought about that. Right. Like, right. do you think I just willy-nilly spent $69 million, lady? Right. I mean, so there is a concept in NFT technology called the greater fool theory, which it, is, it does articulate fairly well 
why NFT technology or NFTs, non-fungible tokens, can be sold at such exuberant prices? Greater Fool Theory basically says, hey, look, if I'm willing to pay X for this particular thing, even if it's vapor or a JPEG or you know, a PNG or whatever, there's always some fool out there who's willing to pay a greater amount than me. And so therefore, I will sell it to that person for a greater amount. One thing I don't like about that is it's quite negative. I mean, it basically makes it sound like this guy's a fool. He's not a fool because here's the thing. This guy paid $69 million, and he's going to enjoy that. If he, if he never sells that again, he found value in it, he had the money for it, and he paid for it, and he's going to enjoy that particular item, and he's going to know that he's the sole owner of that, of that asset. Yeah. Now, he could, however, sell that for $83 million in a couple weeks, and maybe that's what he's planning to do. But at least in the in the interim, he's going to enjoy that that, pe- that yeah, piece of art. Yeah, he owns it. He owns it. And here here uh, here we've brought up uh, his personal website, Vinesh Sundarasan. Uh, he's he's an entrepreneur. He's an angel investor, and he's all about blockchain technology. So. I believe this guy's actually a visionary. I believe he he knows what he's doing. I believe he be, uh, obviously he has a lot of trust in this technology. Hence why block uh Bitcoin is blowing up, you right. know, and worth so much. Like who, who would have thought Bitcoin would go from, you know, $100 to now it's worth Thirty-five thousand, fifty thousand dollars per coin. Right. You know. Yeah, and so, so, and so this is a great concept. I know that it sounds like we're belaboring the point, but the idea, though, it, it, th- these these little stories are paving the way for the sixty-minute journalist, the sixty minutes journalist, to talk about uh, Upland and why Upland is being is becoming wildly successful and how you can be wildly successful using the, building upon these same principles. So in my own life, so uh, back when I was a child or a teenager, I was really into skateboarding. And um, I remember buying a skateboard deck, the wooden part of a skateboard, for about $35. And in 1987, before Loyal Doyle was born, in 1987... <laughs> Tony Hawk, we all know who Tony Hawk is. Tony Hawk came out with the uh, the second edition of his signature model. Actually, technically, it was the third edition. Um, but as far as the icon- iconic bird skull uh, pro model, I'm going way too deep. I apologize. Uh, the second edition oh, I love it. was I in love 1986 it. or maybe 1985. But at any rate... It wasn't just that kind of straight up and down old school board. It had a little bit more of a fishtail cut with a little bit more of kind of the 80s kind of crazy graphics, but it still had that really cool kind of like bird skull, like the hawk skull look on it. Uh, If I had it here, I would show it to you. But at any rate, I remember buying one of those boards in 1986 for $35 from Kona Skate Park in Jacksonville, Florida. Okay, 35 bucks. Then you skate on that board, it gets destroyed, it gets beat up, it's you know basically worthless in yeah, about six months. Yeah, you beat the crap out of it as, <laughs> right. as a skater, as, as you all do. Yeah, now I'm almost kind of bashful to admit this, but in the past year, I actually found one of those boards in a really good in really good shape, an original, not a not a reissue, but a, a original 1986 second edition Tony Hawk model did i pay 35 dollars for it i found it on ebay no i paid 600 dollars for that board (laughs) that you paid 35 dollars for when you were right but you know what nothing has changed over the 30 years as far as the the technology in that board it is the same is that the exact board that you rode no 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 or did you ride like the first edition board oh i had a first edition and a second edition like i was all about it dude the bones brigade was my thing back so in the what day. does a first edition go for nowadays oh that would be like eleven $1, hundred dollars or twelve hundred dollars 
Yeah, I bought the second edition for six hundred dollars. And wow. since I mean, I put some old school trucks on it, some tracker trucks, if you know what I'm talking about. I put some uh, Bones Brigade or some sorry, some Bones wheels on it. And again, I'm I'm going way too deep. Well, but my point dude, is, but the, I I mean, this makes me think of like Back to the Future and his sports betting book. Like, if you could know, yeah, when you're alive, like today, right? What what today is going to be worth, right? A hundred x its value in ten years, yeah. or twenty years, yeah. or thirty years. You yeah, know? exactly. Yeah, that's that's proof that there actually is no thing, no such thing as time travel. Uh, otherwise, if you're a time traveler, if you you were smart, you'd be like, okay, I'm gonna research every freaking major sporting event. I'm gonna bet on that crap when I get when I get back into the present day or you know whatever. I'm gonna look at what uh you know what the Bitcoin was back in the day, <laughs> what the next you know coin is. Anyhow, the point is, the point is this: a skateboard is made of seven layers of Canadian maple board okay wood nothing changed since 1986 and i paid like 10 times 20 times the amount <laughs> because it's meaningful to me it is meaningful to me i have placed value on that board it's meaningful to me i uh, didn't even know it was made of seven layers of canadian maple oh yes, board they call it the seven rock maple uh technology yeah yeah and by the way by the way you mentioned uh back to the future um, if you remember in the first Back to the Future when uh, Alex P. Ke not Alex P. Keaton, but uh, what's his name? Marty McFly was buzzing around on that skateboard, you know, holding onto a car and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I remember that. He was on a Madrid, a Madrid skateboard, and the stuntman was John, John Smelcher, who was a professional <laughs> skateboarder back in the day. And actually, frankly, not a very good one. Dude, the stuff <laughs> you can learn from Vince. <laughs> I know skateboarding. Can, like, his name is McSqueeb. That is the haircut <laughs> right. that Tony Hawk had right. coined, yeah. essentially. Right. And I actually had that in uh, the the late eighties as well. <laughs> so that's why they they call me. So now, I that's, don't have that's much why hair left. you'll hear plenty of references to skateboarding as you listen to the <laughs> Upland Show. Yeah, that is the that. origin of the name McSqueeb. Ye no, I love it. I yeah. love that you like. I've known you for a long time, and these are things I've I've never actually learned learned from you. So yeah. super cool. But I mean, it's the same concept. So Vinesh was saying, "Look, can you touch the Mona Lisa?" You were saying, "You're look, look, lady, you're getting after me for paying sixty nine million dollars for a digital piece of uh, art, and you're saying I can't touch it. Have you touched the Mona Lisa? Do you think there's value in the Mona Lisa?" And you know, he kind of shut her down. You know, and yeah. and the point is, someone could actually say. Yo, bro, Vince McSqueeb, you could actually go buy a brand new skateboard with a little more pop to it, you know, with a little more, you know, better concave or whatever. Um, do you really think there's value in a 19? Yes, there's much value for me in a 19. You wish you would have bought 10 of those when you were a kid and oh, held on dude. to them. And honestly, I believe I'm a, like, I believe I'm a time traveler. <laughs> not Not literally, but honestly... I think I'm on to something. I think we're on to something with this being an early investor in yeah, in this sure. upland in for this sure. upland game. And that's kind of what, what we're coming back to. Uh so the point is value is defined by the person who is paying for it. Exactly. Right? I paid for that skateboard. I defined the value. I mean, yeah, would I would I, would I have paid for it for free? Would, would I have paid a dollar for it? Yes, I would have paid for a dollar for it. But the thing is, is that it was scarce. You add not only the value that you place to it, but also scarcity. That's going to drive the price up. $69 million. There's only one person in the world who can own that. And that guy really wants that thing. It's important to him. It's scarce. The price goes crazy high. And so, yeah, value is what someone defines it. All right. So I know, Tyler, you were going to want to talk a little bit about... Um, uh, we wanted to kind of shift gears and go into one of uh, one of the discussions in the uh, in these episodes about the metaverse and NFT, NFT technology, where the journalist who is who is kind of uh, facilitating this these conversations talks to an uh, intellectual property attorney. Yeah, this lawyer has advised Facebook. She's got a cool background. Uh, but let's hear what she has to say about Upland and about intellectual property 
and and things like that. Kavya Perlman is a leading cybersecurity expert in immersive technology whose advice companies like Facebook on security. She says the current law provides little guidance on how to proceed in the virtual world, which leaves room for lawsuits. And there aren't yet laws in place to regulate the metaverse. Whose virtual property is it? Did this person take consent? Or if, let's say, I did not give consent, can I sue them for making $100 million off of this virtual replica or the you know model that they created. We need to refine these IP laws a little bit uh, to try to understand, okay, if I don't want my place scanned or be put on a virtual world as a, in, piece, in form of an NFT, what do we do? It's not just about homes. It's also famous landmarks. While we were there, Upland auctioned off New York's virtual Rockefeller Center. We waited for the auction, which was set to run for three days to begin. The auction starts April 19th at 12 p.m. And uh, yeah, we have to wait. I think it's a three more minutes. I don't know. Oops, got bought. 12, <laughs> 12 what? Yeah, it's bought. Yeah, the, got bought? Yeah, the auction bought. sold in 10 wait, seconds. I actually was one of the ones trying to buy <laughs> the Rockefeller Center that day. Uh, so this is this is very interesting, actually, and and I would like to speak a little bit on this comment. I believe she's stretching. She's stretching a little bit. The journalist or the attorney? The attorney. The attorney. Okay. I I believe she is stretching these IP laws, and I don't know if we heard. Did we hear in that clip? Sorry, was I? I know we rec- I know. I know we got these clips earlier. Did we hear in that clip where Dirk, the founder of the co-founder of Upland, says, uh, "I'm not very worried about it." Was was that? No, was not that this in clip. That clip. No, we we just we just had the opportunity to hear the the intellectual property attorney voice her concerns that um, there has not been precedence yet for anyone to say, hey, look, you've just made $3 million off the digital version or the virtual version of my home. I want a piece of that. Um, and uh, so we have not heard Dirk's response to that yeah, yet. So so there's, I don't know if it's, I think it's, I think it's at a different section than this, or maybe it was right before that, that clip that, that we just shared with you. But Dirk has a has a great response where he says, "I'm not worried about it at all. Addresses are public, publicly available data. People don't own their address. That's something that's assigned to them when they buy a property. That's a pub. That's publicly available data. And I think that's a great response. And it's true." Uh, the, the, an address is a public identifier assigned to the asset in which you own and live. Like it is like there's yeah, no y- you don't choose your address when you buy a house. It's right. not a license plate for a car <laughs> or right. where you get to if if you want to pay extra money and yeah. design yeah, a true. cool name to it. It's something that's given based on coordinates, based on how the city has already named a road. You didn't choose the name of the road. Right. Nor did nor have I seen a quality an, an, an a, nor have I seen an additional uh uh in I, I nor have I seen really any quality of life come from the fact of my address title. Yeah. You know, it's it's been the home, it's been the people in the home, it's been the experiences we've had in the home. It's not been the address. Exactly. And I think one of the biggest uh, responses I have is what about Google Maps? What about, I mean, can I, I mean, I've owned a, I've owned a house before. I've owned a condo before. Can, if, if Google drives by my house and takes a picture of my house, can I sue them for the intellectual property can I sue them? At, can can I? Let's say when people visit Google Maps, Google decides to show an ad within Google Maps, but people happen to be looking at my house before they. Can I sue them for the 
how many ads have been clicked on while they were no it's pu- it's and 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 talking about skateboarding if let's say i was a famous photographer and i decide to go out skating with some professional skateboarder and he happens to be skating in front of your house and he does a cool trick right in fr- like he grinds the curb right in front of your house he does a cool kick flip onto the curb and grinds it and kick flips off or whatever uh and and i got some cool shots of of him doing that as a photographer can you then sue me for your house being in the background of that photo Especially if that photo became super famous and uh, what was on the cover of Thrasher magazine, right? And generate a lot of wealth to either the photographer or the professional skateboarder. Yeah. The, the I can see what you're saying is, could could I, as the homeowner, have any claim on the wealth or the income that either the the photographer or the skateboarder received as a result from a of digital the, asset? Right, right. I don't know the answer to that question, but I, I don't c- think you could. Yeah, I don't think you could, and that's why my rebuttal of this is like, that's a stretch. Yeah, that's agreed. a stretch. I get that she's like, we don't know what like the metaverse means. We don't know what the virtual world means, but yet we've had photography for how many years? Yeah, and people haven't. There's been zero precedents to be able to sue someone for having your house in the background of a photo or even yeah maybe maybe what you're saying is is there actually is precedence because here's the thing in the game of upland right there's probably i think they just announced that they've already uh, released over a million properties that have they just hit one million properties sold yeah and so I would imagine that 90% of those pro- or 99% of those properties are just regular small, you know, homes, right? And so, yeah, maybe maybe some homeowner out there in Fresno, you know, hasn't been wise to the fact that their house has actually been uh, listed for sale on this game called Upland and that some kid out there bought it for 3 <laughs> bucks and then made a, a an $8 profit when they sold it for $11. And they're like, dang it, I want half of that $11, you know, that $8 profit. I want some of that money. I demand. So maybe there's not been precedence for that. But you can't tell me there's not been precedence of some photographer out there making money off his photos of the Coit Tower or the Golden Gate Bridge. That they don't own. Yeah, They they didn't get permission to to take a photo. I doubt I highly doubt that the photo the number one photo that's been sold of the skyline of San Francisco had approval signed by the mayor of San Francisco <laughs> right, right. or the governor of California or, that yes you can you right. can sell this photo and I, and I agree that you can make money right or any of the individual residences that happen to may be in the skyline of that you know like there there may be Salesforce tower right there may be 4000 the, the CEO of Salesforce has to be like okay I know my building's the tallest building here <laughs> Yes, you may sell or this that photo. Little, that little tiny speck, that little yellow speck, well, that's actually uh, 1312 uh, 9th Street in San Francisco. Yeah, we gotta go, we got to go talk to that guy, make sure he's cool with his light bulb uh, being shown in my... So, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. So, yeah, there has been ref- precedence, precedence, I think. Uh, b- yes, but there's no precedence for the fact that anyone can sue... Right, that's my point. That's my on, point. Yeah. on that. Yeah, we're saying right? the same thing. Yeah, and so, thing. exactly. Uh, and 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 my next rebuttal to the actual positive side of technology like this is this. Uh, if if any of you remember recently, I believe it was in the past few years, Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris caught fire, and most of the roof, most of the top portion of the cathedral was severely damaged, right. caved in. It was really sad because uh, Quasimodo got kind of, he had some second degree burns. Yeah, he was up ringing the bells right. and, poor guy. you know, yeah. b- the poor guy fell. Uh, no. Uh, 
But Assassin's Creed, which is a video game similar to Upland, created a 3D replica. And Assassin's Creed is actually one of my favorite franchises. Uh, I, I, I've, I've mentioned on a previous podcast, I'm big into Xbox. The first Assassin's Creed game was one of my favorite games. Uh, and I also played this one. Uh, I believe this one was 24. I believe this one was Assassin's Creed Syndicate is the name is the name of the game. And they made a 3D model of uh, Notre Dame Cathedral. And in the game, you could actually go and climb this building. You could get very intimate at an intimate level and they did such a good job at designing almost exact replica of this building in a game in a 3d virtual world and the assassin's creed maker said you know hey paris come to us if you need help redesigning cuz cuz i and i remember watching this interview of, I don't know who it was, the president or mayor or wh- whatever they call it in in Paris of, you know, who who who's over Paris, said we're going, we will spare no expense. This really stuck out to me. I I remember watching it. He said, we will spare no expense to rebuild Notre Dame Cathedral exactly as it looked before. And Assassin's Creed reached out and said, come to us. We made a 3D replica. And uh, we have, you know, models that that replicate exactly how it was. And I think that's a really cool example to show it's not all bad. Just because <laughs> just because a three just because there's a virtual building. You know, there's some positive aspects to that, and that may be a stretch to some of you, but I think that was actually a really cool story because they put a lot of work, especially into one of the most iconic buildings in Paris and replicating that. Yeah, it is true. I mean, um, I think that video games, to some degree, get a bad rep from uh, many, in an, uh, especially in an older generation, to say, what value does it does does it create to what value does 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 do video games add to the world? You're just consuming time. You're consuming people's time. You're not. You're you're, you're distracting them from what is being from from their b- ability to be dis- productive, right? Yeah, maybe that's true, but I think you know. Okay, there's always been recreation and leisure throughout the world, but at the same time, what you're showing here is a use case for when. Video games have provided real uh, utility and value to the world, um, especially in uh, reconstructing something super important to the culture um, of at least, you know, I think it's Paris. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that was, I remember. Th- and what's crazy is I happened to go to Paris for the first time in my life only like three months before that fire. Yeah. And I went to Notre Dame Cathedral, did, did really? a tour. That's cool. And I remember being devastated. It was so recent to me that I just went and experienced Notre Dame Cathedral. And I remember feeling like the emotion of, I believe it's the, Sorry, I I apologize. I think it's the president or or, or mayor of Paris, but I remember the news interview and just hearing his passion. Like we will spare no expense to to rebuild this right. exactly as it was. Wow, that's cool. And uh, yeah, I I believe a game as stupid as it sounds, Assassin's Creed was probably one of the only 3D models that replicated this building in it to be exactly as as it was. Yeah. And I imagine they took so many pictures and so many different resources to, to build that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I know we've run a little bit long in this episode, but I, w- I want to share a couple things. Um, one is 
remember that we talked about the title or the, the objective of this particular episode, episode three of the Upland Show, um, being all about the f- that, that the future is the metaverse. And 60 Minutes, again, um, really kind of did this, these two-part two episode, or uh, I guess a two-part episode, I guess is the best way of saying it. They, they stretched it across two episodes where they talked about the metaverse and the NFT technology, and that's all what Upland is. So... Now let's t- let's this kind of t- this kind of talk a little bit about how the uh, you know Upland or the metaverse is the future, or what you know in the in the show is actually calling it as Web 3.0. But before we do that, there's a couple points that were made by the journalist yeah. that I think Loyal Doyle and I take issue with. Um, and uh, do you want to talk about those real quick? Yeah, let's. Should we just jump into the yeah. clip? The the clip first. Yeah, let's do it. And I and I know there was some negative connotation to this. Uh, let's let's hear what uh, the journalist has to say. As we enter Web 3.0, an era whose infrastructure relies heavily on cryptocurrency, an industry dominated by men, the question remains. If men are largely buying up and populating the virtual world, should we be more inclusive when it comes to the builders and the buyers? What is the demographic of your users? At the moment, we we are very a little bit more driven towards male male users. But we believe once we introduce now that people can develop their properties, they can you know create a garden, virtual garden, and so on. Upland's hopefully becoming much more female as well. But I wouldn't want to just develop gardens in the virtual space. I'd want to own property yeah, as you a can female. do that as well, right? Yeah, I think that would be mixture, right? Do you worry that we're going to repeat those mistakes of the past when we built out Web 2.0 and it was largely men? So I hope not, right? So as you've seen today in our session, you know, we're, we're, we're really about diversity in the company. And Upland is the world in a certain sense, right? And we want to be diverse as the world. But largely, New York and San Francisco is already owned by men. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, that's how it started, to be honest, right? Yeah. But uh, I wish more women co- would come to the space. Maybe we can develop together some good ideas. You got to create more. some more space for them yeah, exactly. to come to the place. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. not just gardening. Yeah. Welcome to the future. Well, <laughs> there you have it. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I get it. I get it. Uh, the journalist. Uh, was a little bit offended by Dirk's comment about gardening. Uh, however, you have to first own a property and up. You can't just go to someone else's property and put a garden in their backyard and start <laughs> gardening. Uh, you have to actually first own a property. And I and she said, so you've already released. New York, Chicago, and San Francisco, three large cities, and the majority of your players are men. So that means mostly men own these three cities in the virtual world. However, those three cities are make up a small percentage of all the many cities that are that are coming in the future. And uh all of there's there's hundreds of properties for sale in all of these cities it's not like people bought them and they're not listing them for sale i mean there's opportunity i it's that it it's it's hard to respond that she that she was taking kind of a negative bias towards upland when the game doesn't have any I I I I mean I get that there's sexism in the current culture in in our world but Upland has done nothing to cause sexism or to add to sexism so it's kind of I feel it's a little bit of a stretch to be like well you're adding to sexism Upland is adding to uh, this issue when in reality just because more men have decided to join. That's all. That's all he was really saying. Is more men have joined Upland. He was answering her question. More men have joined Upland than women, 
Yeah. And then she's creating this kind of sexist issue. Uh, it's hard. He, she kind of put him in a hard place. And, and I'm a little bit frustrated as someone who's invested money in Upland that they're trying to kind of put it into this negative light because I believe the future of Upland is bright and will be inclusive to uh, to everyone. There's there's nothing that that really intentionally discriminates against anyone, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think so Loyal Doyle, Tyler and I have known each other for quite a while. And I and I know this about Tyler. Um, nobody wants uh, equality uh, more so than than Tyler, or or someone who believes in equality uh, more so than my friend Tyler. I I also believe um, fundamentally that there should be no gender, uh, race, uh, sex, uh, orientation uh, that should be discriminated against any opportunity. I think we I think most rational human beings would agree with that sentiment. Um, and we want every, we want people from every uh, background, um, every race, every ethnicity, every belief system, every orientation, um, every gender, however you want to des- define that, um, to be in the game. One thing I've noticed about the game is that when you get into the game, the only identifier that I might see in uh, in the other players is their own given uh, username. Yeah, username and avatar. And the avatar, which is a picture that is self. A name is self selected. Right. And an avatar is self selected. So therefore, they appear as they want to appear. Yeah, and 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 maybe if someone chose an, uh, a username like Mister Big Shot. You know, or um, macho bro, you know, or something like that. Um, I don't see personally. I don't see anything in the game that uh, that clearly identifies anyone of color, race, ethnicity, gender, um, and frankly, by the way, the marketing behind Upland. I've not seen, by the way, much evidence of their marketing. I've seen it in social media, but I don't know that I've seen any evidence that they have targeted a certain group by any means. And there's no, certainly no restrictions um, from any type of demographic to, to enter into the game and, uh, and, to, um, and to start immediately buying and selling, investing, and competing. Um, and in fact, one thing that I really appreciate about Upland is they have this uh, entry level, um, I guess, economic entry level ability called the FSA. I can't remember what that's called. The it's Fresh Start Act. Okay, the Fresh Start Act. What that means is, is that there is a host of properties, a number of properties in any given city that are reserved for those who have maybe uh, fewer assets uh, or resources to jump into the game. I'm not saying that women have fewer assets or fewer or, or less money. I'm not saying that uh, you know um, there are other uh, you know races or ethnicity groups that uh, typically have less money. All I'm saying is, is that I've not seen any evidence that um, there's any type of restrictions towards any group to enter into the game. Yeah. And in fact, I've seen, if anything. Um, a, a very proactive effort on the part of the de- the devs of the game to accommodate those of lower income to ch- come in and start competing um, against those who maybe have more resources and they have actually an advantage because their properties are discounted and they can immediately start buying and selling um, at a higher rate even though the, their, their entry points was, again, discounted. Yeah, I actually had a friend join today actually he joined yesterday and he was asking me advice and he started in bakersfield okay and he can buy the cheapest property in bakersfield which is currently 1800 upix 
or one dollar and eighty cents okay the cheapest property being sold in all of Bakersfield California was four thousand two hundred dollars or four dollars and twenty cents that's more than double true so any big time player in the game can't actually go buy that property and flip it for immediately double what they paid for it. However, things like that exist in the real world. So in a way, this game is more fair than the world than the real world actually is. And for the journalists to co- kind of attack Upland a little bit just made me a little bit defensive, if you will, that this game is actually much more inclusive and much more able for anyone to come in and be successful regardless of your background or who you are or any of those variables. So <laughs> jump and, on in. Yeah, and to be clear, you know, it's always a little bit, uh, I don't know, sensitive for two, two white men to be having a conversation uh, about, uh, you know, discrimination uh, of any type. Um, you know, there's, I'm sure there's probably a lot of things we still have yet to learn, both Tyler and I, about uh, these principles and what's, what's happening and the experiences uh, of minorities and, and, uh, and, and the women. Um, all we're saying is, is two things. One is, absolutely, equality should exist in any walk of life. And number two, we're not seeing any evidence that any certain group is discouraged from joining exactly. Upland. And the reason more men are the current demographic of Upland is because Upland is a blockchain technology, just like cryptocurrency. So what's happening in crypto is relative to what's happening in Upland. Right. Uh, let's pull up really quick an article here about the number of women in crypto and blockchain is skyrocketing in 2020 and 2021. So uh, did you read through this article earlier? Yeah, so the point is is that I think historically the article makes the point that for the most part in 2017 and before when crypto technology was becoming an emerging emerging disruption within uh, the finance world as well as the investment world, it was mostly men, mostly younger men, who were jumping in with both feet into the crypto technology world. Now, that also mirrors, by the way, the fact that, uh, that at least in developing nations, um, typically males are more uh, uh, drawn towards uh, STEM you know, types of uh, disciplines, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and uh, we're hoping that women um, will join more into those fields of study. Um, uh, but males do tend to dominate those industries, and crypto technology is, cer- is certainly within the STEM field of science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, crypto technology is built upon not only technology, but math. Um, and so um, it's not to say that uh, you know, women should not be in uh, cryptocurrency, c- and it's never, there's never been, at least as I've known, any instances where crypto technology has discouraged proactively women from uh, investing. Um, so yeah, yeah. In, in fact, one of our best friends, Vince and I, one of our best friends is a, is a woman who's a badass. you know she's a, she's a top leader in the, in the IT industry. and you know, a, a, again, as Vince said, we have no personal bias. We look up to this person and her ability to, you know, lead. We, w- uh, Vince and I historically worked at the same company where she was the CIO. And, you know, 
we're seeing in this article that more and more women are jumping into these technologies. It's not at any fault. I, I think the main point we're trying to make here is there's no fault of the Upland game and what they've done and what they're trying to create that more men have joined than women. Correct. Yeah, uh, so in, in this article it states that in 2020, um, the, the rate of adoption with women has uh, increased um, by exponential amounts. Um, and in fact, actually, it's almost about... 55 45 55 percent of of investors in crypto technology are men whereas 45 percent are women at least as according to this article in uh, 2020 and upland is an extension of crypto technology nfts and so yes there are more males in the the game of upland so yeah uh but we hope that 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 hope that that changes and it's more of a 50 50 thing um so all of you ladies out there please join uh you know upland yeah please join upland put your money in there kick our butts man let's do this yeah we want us we want this we again the future of upland is bright jump in now uh we're at the very beginning to even i mean what maybe one percent of the world's properties have actually been sold in upland to even think that it's been dominated any way shape or form the future of upland i believe is to sell every property that exists in the world every plot of land will be purchased and developed in the digital world and that invitation is open to anyone in any country uh, and a any type of person can can join and it's exciting yeah okay so let's wrap this up um, the last thing we want to say is again we want to end with where we began we began with the the title of kind of what we wanted to talk about tonight and that is that the future is the metaverse or the metaverse is the future come on and start land grabbing with us and and so to to end on that note there was a question by the journalist that she posed to Dirk when she said okay you have you've shown me upland you show me how to purchase a property you showed us the uh, the auction where the Rockefeller Center was purchased within 10 or 15 seconds for forty thousand dollars <laughs> so you showed us upland but that's upland 1.0 what dirk is the vision for upland 2.0 and beyond and his response was freaking awesome basically what he said was this is beyond just buying and selling properties this is not just a real estate or monopoly a game of digital monopoly this is an opportunity for us to try to redefine the world in a way that is healthy, in a way that is more inclusive, and in a way that is more interactive, and in a way that is more lucrative and safe. And so, um, you know, he's talking about these third-party businesses that are coming in. He's talking about other experiences. He's talking about um, cultural events that could happen within the, uh, the, the metaverse. I mean, frankly, one of my favorite things to do is to go and listen to live music. And one of the, I mean, if I were to create a business in Upland, one of the things I would love to do is to create a little like little concert venue in Upland and have exclusive NFT live recordings. With real world artists. With real right? world artists and say, hey, guess what? You know, um, live concerts. Yeah, live in concerts. Upland. We're going to have. Uh, Freaking, I don't know. Um, Death Cab for Cutie is going to be at my my venue. And that's because I have, as a business owner within the metaverse, contacted the manager of Death Cab for Cutie and invited him to, to the, invited that band to play in this venue inside of the metaverse. That's just a silly example. Yeah. But the point is that Dirk is saying, this is where we're headed. This is the future. Yeah, there's a lot of problems in our real world, and we have to deal with those head on. 
And in, every now and then, though, it's nice to take a break and jump into the metaverse and live in utopia where we do a little bit of, you know, there's no race, there's no gender, it's avatars, it's interaction, it's making some money, and uh, it's a good time. So yeah, and the metaverse is limitless. Right. The metaverse is the start of a new world that we get to create ourselves, that we get to start from scratch. And we're at phase one of 5,000 iterations yeah. of the metaverse, of the digital world. It's crazy to even think that it's a reality that we're actually starting to have a digital world that represents the real world in any way, shape, or form. And it's cool that any of you can be a part of it. You can shape the future of it. Uh, businesses, you can pitch any type of business to the owners of Upland, and they will review that and decide if it's it's a good idea for the economy of Upland. And in the future, I believe the metaverse will be run by all of the players even, right. and Dirk has even said this. He wants it to be run by the players even more than the owners of the game, which is super exciting. Again, it's very inclusive. Everyone is invited to join. We would love for anyone to join. Please join us in the metaverse that is Upland. All right. That is a great way to end this episode. Join us again for episode four, which will be coming in a few days. Um, in the meantime, we are going to be creating some of these uh, l shorter form how-to videos, um, and we'll be posting this on the channel. Until then, enjoy the metaverse, and we'll see you next time.